Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. In September, we spent a couple days in Shelbyville, Tennessee to cover the second annual American Mule and Bluegrass Festival. On the first day, we rode the wagon train, which went from festival founder Marty Ray Gordon's farm to the festival grounds in Shelbyville. We'll have that story next week. Today, we'll show you a little of what was going on at the festival. Mules live longer than horses. We know of two mules that young kids are riding them right now that are 40 years old. Most horses live to maybe almost 30, 31 or 32. Mules can live as long as 40. Uh, we know the age of mules and horses and donkeys by looking at their teeth. We age them by their teeth. The longer their teeth get, the older they are. They have baby teeth, and once they shed all of these teeth in the front, they're over five years old. This is Jill. She's about eight years old. Her mate is Jack, Jack and Jill. I'm going to go over the harness just a little bit. These are the hames. They're hooked to the trace chains. And the trace chains are hooked to whatever they're pulling. That hooks to the wagon, the plow, or the disc, or whatever it is. And it is hooked to the, the hames that it collar sits on her shoulders and it protects her shoulders okay this is the bridle and this is Olivia hi guys <laughs> she's 13 years old and she's my helper today she's been helping me all through the every class has come through this so I'm really thankful for her today um, this part of the harness because this is in the book now y'all need to know this is the britching now most time, I want to warn people, you don't normally get behind mules because they have legs and they can kick, okay? So if you don't trust them, you don't know them, don't get behind them. It's not safe. A horse, a donkey, or a mule, okay? But I happen to know Jill, and I'm real, she knows me, and we've hooked up a lot of times, okay? A mule usually don't require as much water or feed than a horse. They can go long distance with less water and less feed. They do good on grass and hay. Lower protein stuff, they do real good. So they're plant eaters. They're not meat eaters. Some of the questions I had the other day want to know what were they they eat plants, grass, hay. They're real good at getting by with just a little bit of good grass and hay. The, the attributes on the mule, I want to talk just a little bit about the mule. The, the mule usually don't have as much flight from fear as the horse. When they get in a situation that they're fearful of, they don't usually run as far as a horse. A donkey runs less. The donkey's always trying to think about himself and trying to protect himself, okay? He is really looking for some obstacle or something that he might not get through it. So. But the mule, the mule, what we like about the mule, they're real good from head to toe, or head to, head to, to rear. They like to line up and follow another mule. That's what makes them good. The firefighters in California right now, the firefighters are using mules to transport equipment, food, rakes, shovels, whatever it is to fight the fire into the fire. They use mules to do that. The Army has used mules in almost every conflict except one war, the Korean War. 
They have used them in World War I, World War II, Iraq, Afghanistan. They've used mules. The mascot of the Army is a mule. That's how much we think about mules. They are so durable and sustainable. They're dependable. Almost every road that you've traveled, mules have helped build those roads from east to west, from north to south. Before equipment, we had to have mules to haul the gravel in to make the roads. The people from the east went to the west, they hauled wagons. We got wagons here, chuck wagons like this right here. The mules pulled those. This is a hitch wagon. It was on the Alaska pipeline. Worked on, they used it on the Alaska pipeline. Uh, this is a cook wagon. These two cook wagons are set up here. A lot of times mules pull those to the west and were used. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions, short questions right now. Has anybody got any questions? Why would you make a mule to a mule? What does that make? You don't get anything. Mules do not reproduce. They're a hybrid animal. They're 63 chromosome, an odd number. It's a good question. They cannot re... They, Normally, 100% do not reproduce, okay? Um, one of the trivia questions I'm going to tell y'all, if all the mules were killed or died in America, everywhere in a, on the planet, how quick could we have another mule? Uh, not too quick. Not too quick? How soon? How soon? One year. 11 months. Take 11 months to produce another mule because that's the gestation period of a mare, a horse. So why do you call it a mule? Why is the name a mule? That's a good question. I have no idea who come up with the name mule, but I will research that for I may have to ask Steve Edwards that. He's a mule clinician here. Why did they come up with the word mule? The mules have been around since biblical time. King David preferred a mule over a donkey and a horse. Yes. How often do they drink? Well, they can go longer than horses, but we make sure that the mules have water all the time, usually. They have access to water. Mm -hmm. um, how, what if they get tired in the middle when they're pulling a cart? Well, they will slow down. That's one thing about a mule takes from a donkey. They won't hurt themselves, usually. They will slow down. But they're more durable. A horse will keep going until it usually founders or something happens to him. He has that stamina, and the mule is in that protection mode for that donkey side of the house. Okay? Yes, ma'am. How do you know it's a girl, boy? Okay. This, this, a female mule is called a molly mule. Okay? This is a female mule. It is a molly mule. A male mule, we call them John mules. Okay? This mule has udders that makes her a female mule. And we can look in the back end, and she is a female mule. But they do not reproduce, okay? I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, one more question. How fast can mules drive? How fast? Probably 20, 25 miles. They are slower usually than horses, but they're faster than donkeys, okay? The horse usually runs out, outrun a mule most of the time. Uh, but they are faster than donkeys. Good question. If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is Fieldwork, showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each or you can buy two for $44.95 or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. We are cooking for the wagon train and also speaking to some school kids about the uh, chuck wagon, the history of the chuck wagon. 
and uh, the history of that. Well, pretend I'm one of those school kids. Talk to me a little okay. bit about that history. How y'all doing today? <laughs> We're doing good. Y'all know what this is? Chuck no, wagon. they'll say. <laughs> this is a chuck wagon. This is America, America's first food truck. Mr. Charlie Goodnight, back in 1866, took an army surplus wagon, a Studebaker, and uh, slapped a box in the back of it so they could haul their uh, uh, supplies and uh, cooking utensils to feed the cowboys on the cattle drive. And uh, they had their, their canteen, they had a, a coffee grinder, which this is supposed to be attached to the wagon. They put their coffee beans in here and grind the coffee. And uh, that's, uh, that's what they use the chuck wagon for. The, the, the cookie, that's what they call the cook. He was the mama, he was the doctor, he was the dentist, he was the pastor. So anything they needed, pretty much, they went to the cook. And the cook was the second uh, highest paid on the cattle drive. The, uh, the drover or the foreman, the boss, he was first highest paid and the cook was the second highest paid. Do you set up like this uh, quite a bit over the years? Yes, sir. We, we've been doing this for a few years. We, uh, we do mostly uh, veteran fundraisers. Matter of fact, we're organizing one in Corinth, Mississippi called Wagons for Veterans of the Crossroads. We've done uh, wagons for veterans in Texarkana. We've done uh, wagons for uh, warriors in Lebanon, Missouri. We've done that three years in a row. And I've uh, pulled a chuck box out, slapped it in the back of my truck, and have went all the way down to Del Rio, Texas to help feed the Border Patrol Thanksgiving last year. That was an honorable task to, to handle. A uh, long trip, but it was w well worth it. Very honorable. Wagons for Veterans will be our first annual uh, chuck wagon veteran fundraiser. First uh, chuck wagon fundraiser for veterans east of the Mississippi. We will be uh, in Corinth, 511 South Tate Street in Corinth, Mississippi, November the 12th. Lunch will be served at 12 o'clock, and uh, uh, it's open to the public. And uh, $12 for an armband, $6 for veterans, and uh, from uh, 11 to 6, it's, it's $6, five and under is free. And the money goes to? It goes for their veterans. We got several different projects through the uh, American Legion that uh, the money will go uh, all for veterans, but we've got uh, one uh, veterans children's scholarship program some money will go toward that and there's just uh, like helping veterans go to the VA if you know gas money and such also. These are lard cans and we store uh, seasonings, coffee, flour and such in these and like I done explained about the coffee grinder. Uh, this is our chuck box. We got different drawers here that we got uh, our supplies in and this is called the boot pan box on the bottom and you 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 would put your heavier pots in there to keep from being so top heavy and uh, uh, toolbox we got a lantern we got a hanger that goes here that swings out so you can see so the cook can see while he's working That's what that's for. We don't need no lantern right now. Uh, we've, got, we've got a saw to cut our firewood with, or what they would have used in the day. We don't use it today because we've got chainsaws. Yep. We've got our lantern. We've got our rifle in case the engines get after us, which is just a prop for looks. It's an old, old muzzle loader. Cowboy chaps in case we get too hot on our legs around the fire. We got our firewood. Over here we got our water barrel, which uh, I'm a little, uh, I like my stuff level. So I got a level, which they wouldn't have had that back in the day. We have got axes that they would have used. We've got 100 year old shovels that they would have used. I still use them occasionally. And uh, that's what they would have had back in the day. Over here we have our cowboy 
firebox. That's what we do a lot of our cooking on. I've got a, a cowboy skillet here that's got to be cleaned and worked on a little bit before we can use it. We have a modern Oklahoma Joe smoker, but that's for barbecue for tomorrow. But uh, that, that wouldn't have been in the, the period. Now this, they would have used a, a wood cook stove. Some of them would have used a wood cook stove in the late 1800s or the early 1900s, but they would have pulled a little pup wagon behind and they would have hauled it in it because it's very heavy. Well, the ones back then was very heavy. This one's heavy, but I've made, modernized it a little bit, but made it look old with the, yeah. the mill trucks that come off of a harrow and the plow handles, which that's my fire starter. That, they wouldn't have had that back in the day. But we haven't got a fire built yet in this. Uh, pots and pans, and, and this is our menu board, which we don't have our menu on yet. But we'll set it out here so they can see it. What will you be cooking tomorrow? Tomorrow we're gonna have uh, uh, Boston butt, pork, pork butts, barbecue, uh, beans, potato salad, and uh, slaw, you know, your normal fixings. Today we're doing uh, uh, pinto beans, cornbread fritters, and uh, uh, chicken and dumplings, peach cobbler, no, uh, apple cobbler and strawberry cobbler today. And fried potatoes with little smoky sausages and onions in it. So people really tend to like that. You got a hold of it, man? That a girl, good for you. All right, now watch this hand and watch this hand. Here we go. You ready? Here's this hand first. Now, I'm going to build a foundation to here, to here, to there. All right? Watch my hands. Here's my first command to her. Then I get quiet. Here's my second command to her. Here's my third command to her. Okay, now did you notice? Did you see me pull her? <laughs> I, I, you still love me, right? <laughs> did you see me do that? Yeah. Did you see my hands move? Mm -hmm. Barely, right? All right, did you notice I built a foundation? I just didn't say, come over here. I, now she's starting to brace. What does your mule do? Brace. He braces you, why? You pulled on him. You pulled on him. Don't pull on a mule. You don't need to. All you gotta do is just show him the way. I just showed her the way, okay? Your daddy paid a lot of money to train you. Okay, you ready? All right, now watch this. What did I just do? I just taught my mule to back up. Right brain, right leg. First, I built foundation of moving in the, in the nose, in the shoulder, then in the hip, then in the foot. Each time I ask, and then I told with a little bit heavier pressure, and then I demanded. Natural mulemanship, okay? Now we watch this. Watch my hands, okay? Again, watch my hands. Now, once I got my mule thinking about this, and we can get a backup. Now watch this over here. We're gonna, we, got, we, we trained one side, so now we gotta train the other, okay? Now we're gonna add to it. Now we're gonna to add to it. There. Notice only the left foot moved. Y'all see that? My right hand told my right side to stand still. My left side made her uncomfortable. Comfortable, uncomfortable. Y'all hear that? It's really important. Now, once I get them this far, then I do three today. Got it? It's a dance, right? Okay, three today. Then the next day I do those three and then three more, right? Y'all got the picture? Mm -hmm. I just don't, oh, I, I, he's doing good, I'm gonna do some more. No, no, stop. That's training, that is not building a foundation. Y'all seeing the difference now? Mm -hmm. You see it? All right, now watch this. I want the lightest touch to get the most. Now, once I got my, my good little mule here going, now I want to get, I want to, I want to say right brain, left brain, right brain, left brain, ready? Okay, right brain, left brain, right brain, left brain. 
Gosh, you see me pulling my hands a lot? You didn't see me do that, did you? Did you see me pull on them really hard to make them stop? What do they do? Brace. They brace. You pull on them, they're going to brace you. Hi, I'm Bob Crager. I'm the author of the book, Historic Barns of Ohio, and I hope you enjoy these amazing barn stories. This barn is Northwest Ohio in Henry County, and I call this Georgia's Giant. It's one of the most amazing barns in the entire country. But sadly, it burned down in 1985. But uh, I'm glad that I found some old pictures of it and was able to capture it uh, in the painting and also in the essay. And this area, unlike southeastern Ohio, is as flat as a pancake, and it's wonderful farmland. It's probably some of the most productive in Ohio. Well, uh, it, uh, it's an interesting story, and uh, it traces back to a farmer, and it's also featured in my book along on the cover. Now, George, George Hyslop built this barn in 1910. And he was a successful turkey farmer at the time but he wanted to move a couple notches up. So he must have hired an incredible architect who built this barn. This looks like a Chinese pagoda. And uh, he must have borrowed a lot of money from the bank to do it because it wasn't cheap, it was a huge barn. Uh, that was 1910. And that was the beginning of a wonderful time for farmers because uh, they had a lot of demand for their products. And this was just an incredible barn. It was 10,000 square feet. It had five, store, five stories to it, four silos. It had a huge cistern that collected rainwater, which drained into seven tanks to water the livestock. It had a cart that would go around to feed the livestock. It was, it was just incredible. And at one point, he had 100 head of cattle, 14 horses, 600 chickens, and about 200 hogs. So he he was moving up from turkeys into diversified farming. But apparently he wasn't all that successful because when he died in 1920, um, he was deeply in debt. But somehow his wife, his widow, held on to the farm for about 10 years. Uh, she sold it to a local Ford dealer. Yes, a local Ford dealer in 1931 at the beginning of the Great Depression. And he must have been doing pretty well because he had a bright idea to take all of his used motor oil and apply it to the size of the barn. And that preserved it beautifully. Uh, it gave it kind of a, a warm uh, golden brown glow to it. And uh, a friend of mine gave me a photo he took of it in the 1970s. And that, I used that as the photo reference for the painting. But unfortunately, it burned down in 1985. And with it, another story of Ohio's beginning days. The rural American countryside is still filled with historic old barns built a century or more ago, but they won't be standing forever. To commemorate and capture the images and stories of the old barns, Ohio native Bob Kruger began painting and writing their histories, and that's all come together in a new book called Historic Barns of Ohio. You can get your copy by calling 877-647-2452 or visiting ruralheritage.com. It costs just $23.99 plus $7 shipping. Call 877-647-2452. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.